Hi, this is Brenda Sauter from the Feelies and Wild Carnation. You are watching for BassPlayersOnly.com. Hello and welcome to ForBassPlayersOnly.com. I'm John Liebman, founder and first baseman. You know, a lot of people think they're too old or it's too late for them to learn how to play an instrument. So I created For Bass Players Only for people mostly over 50 who want to learn to play bass because I believe you're never too old and it's never too late to experience the joy and the pleasure of making music. For BassPlayersOnly.com, that's what we're all about. We've got a very exciting guest this week, Brenda Sauter. You might know her as the bass player from the Feelies. And she's done a lot of other stuff. She was with the Feelies from the early 80s until the band's hiatus in 1992. That band has done a lot of cool stuff, touring, opening up for bands like R.E.M. and Lou Reed and the Velvet Underground. And Peter Buck from R.E.M. cited that band as an influence for R.E.M.'s sound. Brenda has also played with the Tripes, the Willies, Young Woo, and she's a founding member of Wild Carnation. And there's a lot of overlap between those bands because a lot of them have the same people from one band to another, but each band does have its own unique sound, its own aura. The big news today is the remastering and the re-release of that band's album, Tricycle, which I've been listening to lately and enjoying it very much. So lots to talk about. Welcome, Brenda. It's great to have you on ForBassPlayersOnly.com. Thank you, John. There's a lot, as I mentioned, that we want to talk about, but I'd like to start with the early days, if that's all right with you. I'm sure our audience would be interested to know about your musical upbringing, your initial exposure to music. You come from a musical family, parents, brothers and sisters, records playing, things like that around the house. How would you describe all that? Yeah, uh, that's that's everything there. Uh, older brothers playing records, um, starting with violin, not for too long, um, but piano being the main instrument from age maybe six on up through um, teenager, um, being inspired by music, um, taking guitar lessons when I was in fifth grade, um, and then taking up bass out of necessity, actually. Um, I mean, up until that point, up until I was like 19 or so, it was mainly piano and guitar. And uh, I was in a group, you know, we were trying to get a, a group going and everyone played guitar. Um, there was a keyboard, so I would jump onto keyboard uh, but for the most part, we had three or four guitars strumming. And um, actually, as I bought my first bass and started to take bass lessons, that group dissolved. And so I decided to keep with the bass, which was probably the best decision I ever made musically. And, um, you know, just took lessons for a while. And then my teacher said, go out and find a band. So there were some things happening in the meantime, like right after taking lessons, I got back with those people who, uh, you know, which the, the band had dissolved. And we, we picked up with a few people, kind of like the tripes and the feelies later on. You, you start out as a group and then a few go one way and others may go the other way and then you find each other again. And it just keeps kind of going in this, this, circle this uh you know kind of a beautiful circle um uh so by that time new wave was starting to come in and um you know we were doing talking heads covers and um and then the the feelies chapter came a little bit later i want to back you up for just one second uh what kind of records were you did you overhear in the house that your brother your brothers were playing uh beatles Beach Boys, um, you know, there, there were others like Herman's Hermits and other, like the 60s, 60s pop, 60s rock, uh, Rolling Stones. Um, no one who was obscure. Uh, so when I um, met the, the Heldon people, 
Um, I, there was a lot of like a lot of learning that I did about the more obscure um, yet very influential bands like television, um, Eno, you know, what would have been, I guess what you would have called the indie movement if it had been called indie back then or alternative. I don't know what, I don't know what you call the Velvet Underground or television back then. You call it underground. Yeah. <laughs> Who was it that said that underground describes a band that's never had a hit yet? Mm-hmm. <laughs> was it Bill Graham or somebody like that that said. But they certainly influence, you know, a lot of bands. Absolutely. I, I, I there was certainly a lot on the East Coast. You're from New Jersey, right? Right. Okay, because when I think of underground, I, I think of the whole West Coast, San Francisco, hate ashbury and, and mm-hmm. all of that that was going on. Were you influenced by any of that as well? Uh, a little bit less. I mean, I was I was younger at that time. Um, you know, I, I'd see in the in the news about um, the, the California scene, but um no, I, I wasn't really in the know on that. I mean, later on, yeah. Um, like I said, I did a lot of, you know, learning about things in the past because I, I just missed them when I was a, a kid. But but I was um, I was much more into R and B, and I didn't even realize that till later on. Um, but it was kind of a, a recent reminiscing. Like I could picture myself playing with Barbie dolls. And hearing Gladys Knight, wow. you know, and and I have this really strong connection with the music at a at a pretty young age, you know. But but it's it's what was being played on AM radio. I mean, we weren't listening to FM just yet, and um, you know, there was some schmaltzy stuff, but but there was a lot of really good music on uh, you know Sly and the Family Stone. Um, I, you know, I, I just can't name all the groups, but those are the ones that I can remember so clearly, uh, like the sound. Um, also, George Harrison. I remember hearing, you know, George Harrison coming through the, the radio. Yeah, post Beatles, you mean? or the? the uh, well, the just blues, like barely blues. post Beatles. Yeah, like 71. Okay. You know, as it was happening. All things must pass. Um, yeah, okay. yeah. What about the bass? Once you discovered it, started taking lessons, and obviously took a liking to it, did you <laughs> yeah. have any any bass player influences? Anybody uh, catch your attention? I, yeah, I would say um, Paul McCartney. Although I didn't realize at the time, this would have been. So what I'm referring to is something that I would have heard as a little girl you know, hearing my brother's records. And I would have to think that that, you know, that was percolating as I was starting to take up the bass. Um, But uh, foremost would be John McVie. Um, And not a real flashy player by any means, but solid, you know, Fleetwood and Matt McVie together were just, you know, like butter on bread, really, they really locked in together. And that whole locking with the drummer is what really resonated. Like that got me really excited and determined to figure that out and and just get better at that. So definitely John McVie. Yeah, you're, you're getting me excited talking about <laughs> bass and in with the drum. Pentatonic scale. And I actually, I remember... Um, being at one of my bass lessons and, you know, I could bring in music and he would answer questions. And so um, is it called say that you love me? Yeah. Say you okay. love me. They love me. All right. And yeah, um, good baseline. saying, okay, what, what is this? What is he doing? And I learned pentatonic scales and that just. What else do you need to know? Exactly. Exactly. <laughs> they sound good. They fit. Um, so that was just so cool to learn this new type of scale, um, you know, like years after piano or guitar lessons. Let's talk about the feelies. Was that the, the first major thing that you did professionally? 
Uh, yes. Um, prior to that, um, I was playing in small places in New York, but really it's that whole phase of trying to get off the ground. You know, you're trying to get a start. Um, but the feelies, I mean, they were already an icon and to just kind of step into that. Um, yes, that was the, the, the biggest group that I had been, um, you know, involved with. But before that, I was in the tripes. So, um, and they were in 83, they, their, I don't want to call it career, um, but the, the group was getting off the ground, you know, kind of like a plane taking off. And um, we were recording uh, Explorers Hold was about to come out. So that group was doing, was doing well, you know, we had a, we now had a record out. Um, we would play in Boston, um, along the East Coast, like, I don't, you know, I'm not sure if we ever got to Washington or not. Um, but let's just say, you know, Northeast Coast. Um, Michael Stipe referred to us in, I think it was a Village Voice as a, uh, he was asked, what are your favorite bands? And he, he listed the tripes as one of them. So we really, it was a really exciting time. Um, and then that, for me personally, um, the tripes then segued into uh, Young Wu and the Willies. And then eventually the Willies became the Feelies. Um, so all those, um, all those bands did not have a bass player. I mean, the Feelies had had a bass player, but um, as, as I stepped into the Willies circle, um, that play, well, actually that bass player had moved on. Keith had, had moved on. Um, he wasn't doing music anymore. So that left the, you know, the Feelies um, bass department um, vacant. And there you were. And there I was. So I, I felt very, very lucky to have chosen that instrument because um, that, that's what helped open the door. I, I saw a description of the, the band's music. <laughs> Somebody described it as jangle pop. <laughs> what, do, what do you think of that? Uh, Wild Carnation? Or I thought it was the feelies. Well, well, it could be, yeah, it could be the feelies. Um, but jangle pop is the, um, the tag that's been given to wild carnation. Okay. Cause we've, I, we've got a little more 12 string happening on the song. I've never heard that term before. I've been nope. around <laughs> a long time and I just thought, okay, that's interesting. Yeah. Well, someone, um, someone commented on a YouTube video of wild carnation and call it jangle pop bliss. There you go. I, I love that expression. Yeah. What's not to love there? Yeah. I, yeah. I want to get on to Wild Carnation in a minute, but uh, but Peter Buck produced the second album of the Feelies, right? Yeah, The Good Earth. Good Earth. Okay. And um, I, I just have to ask you, uh, Mike Mills, you, you toured with, with our, you opened up for REM, so you got right. to know the guys in the band. Did you get to know Mike very well? Not really well, but we did, we did hang out to a point. Actually, um, we were allowed to be backstage while REM played. And there were a couple of times when I held his drink <laughs> for him. <laughs> okay. So I guess he came backstage and handed me a drink for, to hold. He trusted you, huh? He, he trusted you to just <laughs> hold it. I guess so, just drink. to hold it. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Um, well, did you did well, actually, I, I should say that, bass that his bass playing uh, is definitely an inspiration, but that came a little bit later, like early, um, I guess, while I was in the tripes. Um, I did have a Rickenbacker already, and I think what happened was that I, um, I saw R.E.M. on MTV. There was 120 minutes, which would be on late at night, but that's when they would play the alternative you know, the alternative music. And I remember seeing the video and he's playing a Rickenbacker and I just went like, whoa, um, you know, really excited to see that. So I really honed in on his bass playing. Um, I mean, it's definitely melodic, it's rhythmic. Um, so it wasn't an early influence, but definitely I, you know, really 
like his uh, bass playing. Yeah, yeah. He's, he's a baseball fanatic too, I believe, isn't he? Mm -hmm. Him and, and Getty Lee also. Yeah. Um, so, yeah. So sorry. We so we did interact with them, but um, you know when you're opening for someone, especially, yeah. And the same thing with Lou Reed. Um, you give them their space. You you don't want to be annoying. You don't want to be following them around. So we we kept we kept sort of a distance. But they would come up to us and talk. Like Michael Stipe would come up and talk to Dave. He talked to me. Um, Pete was. Yeah, you know, there were conversations uh, with, with all of them, actually. So they were they were very, very gracious. They they did not have uh, any attitude. This was what, like mid 80s or so, give or take? Uh, we opened for REM in 86. Okay. But I, I was going through memorabilia and I did find an REM backstage pass from 1985. So I believe through... Uh, well, through the Feelys manager, Steve Fallon, we were able to get, um, well, probably a, um, a link between either Pete Buck and us or our manager and, and Pete Buck or REM's management, we, you know, however it worked out. Um, yeah, we did have a backstage pass in 1985. I was very surprised to see that. That's cool. Yeah. That's enjoyable. Let's talk about Wild Carnation, uh, the re-release of Tricycle. That was the 1994 debut. And I saw a description that I really liked. Somebody, some reviewer or critic or something described it as an underheralded classic of Garden State folk rock. <laughs> and I really, oh. I really like that. <laughs> what, why is that particular album being re-released now? How did that get chosen? It is... It is serendipity. Uh, do you want the long story or the short story? Uh, let's start with the short and we can always embellish if we need to. Okay. Uh, so the Feelys played at the Colony in Woodstock. And mm -hmm. there was um, uh, an owner of a small record company, Pine Hill, in the audience. And he bought um, two Wild Carnation CDs from the merch table afterwards. He had never heard of Wild Carnation, um, mm -hmm. but he bought, he bought them. And listened to them, really, really loved it. Couldn't understand why he never heard of Wild Carnation, but was glad, you know, to have uh, gotten those CDs. So he reached out and said that he wanted to put Tricycle out on vinyl. And suddenly, after almost 30 years, now there's someone interested in it. Tricycle was out of print, basically. So he got one of the last copies that was literally available. Um, we, so that opened this, um, scenario where we weren't sure, well, do we go with our original record company? Do we go with Pine Hill? Um, so we ended up going with, um, with Delmore, our original company. So we went from very little activity to two small record companies wanting to put it out on vinyl and then tr it's feast or famine. And then just trying to decide which one to go with. Um, but Pine Hill is going to be putting out Superbus, which is our second album. Um, that Superbus was recorded in 2000, but we didn't put it out till 2006. Um, Rich, the guitar player, and I are married. We had a baby in 2000. So it was kind of like uh, what John and Yoko did when Sean was born. You don't you don't plan it, but you it's like five years before you start to get back into making music again. It's just a, a natural thing that happens. Uh, so it was really um, um, Tino, the owner of Pine Hill, um, getting a copy of those two CDs and then wanting to put it out on vinyl. That's great. That's uh, it's got to be exciting for you. Yeah, yeah. And, and so the two projects have been kind of neck and neck uh, at this point. So this is um, this is April 2023. Um, Superbus is now at the manufacturing plant and should be out in the fall on vinyl for the first time. OK, so he felt that bullish about it that he didn't want to wait to see the uh, the, the success of the re-release of the first. No, album. Um, I mean, he's a, yeah, yeah. Um, 
I, I admire him for being okay with having kind of lost tricycle, but saying, I'll put out super bus. Oh, I see. I mean, he didn't walk away from us. He, he wanted to put one of them out. So, you know, appreciative to that, of, of that. Well, well, we'll have to have a follow-up interview. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Like I said at the beginning, I've been listening to it and there's some great tunes. Susquehanna 142. That's about mm-hmm. a train, right? Yes, it is. A, it is literally a train. And Dodger Blue about the Dodgers leaving New York for California way before our yeah. time. Yes. <laughs> right. <laughs> I particularly like Trailer Song, which you describe again, REM reference as having a Michael Stipe approach. Mm hmm. Um, yeah, um, what I, I mean, I, I'm definitely influenced by Bob Dylan, but that's, you know, obviously from a, from a younger age. Um, but what I liked about Michael Stipe's lyrics, and I know that there are others who have done, um, similar things is, um, to just have to, to describe images and put them together. Um, and you could take the words literally, you could read into them. Um, so, you, you know, you can tell a story like Dodger Blue, or you can have just images or feelings like trailer song. You know, I can't find my hand. Well, obviously your hand is right there, but, but picture you're in a situation that's so dark and you can't even find your hands you know it's something along so not to be too heavy but oh i'm um, glad i asked (laughs) so some some lyrics have come from um a book of just you know jotting down ideas and other songs have come out of deciding gee i want to i want to write about the brooklyn dodgers and they're moving to la and what what might that have been like? There is some great bass playing on the record too. Well, thanks. You're, you're primarily a pick player. Is that right? Yes and no. I started with um, using my fingers and then in the feelies, I, you know, I think it was during a recording process um, or a re- recording session where Bill and Glenn asked if I would play a, using a pick. And I, I get that because you do get the percussiveness. Um, it's very clear where when the note is striking um, versus a more rounded sound when you use your fingers. And so the, the note just kind of, it's, it's a slow wave. Um, so in the feelies, yes, I played pick, except for the song Slipping. Um, slipping, it doesn't work with the pick. It's got to be the the John McVie, you know, yeah. first of all, two fingers. There you go. So, um, so the pick was out of, out of necessity. Uh, but then I went back to using uh, fingers again. What about your approach for coming up with the right baseline for a song? I was reading an interview and, and something you said, I wanted to ask you about. You said, I always feel like there are too many chords to choose from it's too difficult to sit down and write a song out of nothing. But if I hear a chord progression, I could usually easily hear lyrics and melodies to go along with it. Would you care to comment on that? Yeah, well, that says pretty much all of it. Um, I have written songs all on my own. Um, But when I sit down to write a song, I I just don't know where to start. Um, There are people who will sit down with a guitar And just, you know, just play while they're watching TV or something. Um, I I guess I feel like I have to sit down and have something in in mind. And and it it just doesn't work with me. Um, But when I'm listening to something, I can hear, um, you know, I can hear the melody. I can hear harmony. I can hear the bass part starting to, you know, come out of those chords. Um, yeah, that's just, that comes more from my soul than sitting down and saying, I'm going to write a song and it's going to start with a G or, you know, whatever. 
Your way sounds a lot more authentic to me. <laughs> and, and, you know, why struggle with something when you have, in my case, you have a husband who comes up with chords and songs. I mean, he's got hundreds of, of um, songs that, or, or parts that could be formed into a song. They just keep coming out of his brain and, you know, he'll hear the progressions. I don't. Tell me about that beautiful work of art that's hanging over your shoulder <laughs> behind you. Yeah, the Mustang. Um, so I, well, I got rid, rid of the, I, I sold the Rickenbacker years ago, um, bought a, uh, bought a Fender, actually a couple Fenders. So I, um, really like the Fender sound, although the Fenders were notorious for having um, dead spots on the neck and then some louder spots. Um, and I have a couple other basses. Um, I've got a um, Dan Electro that I love to play. Um, but what's behind me is a, a Mustang. Um, and the story behind that is that um, <clears throat> Uh, the group Real Estate opened for the Feelies in Brooklyn. It was an outside um, festival. And um, oh, I'm blanking on the name. The bass player from Real Estate, Alec, Alex, um, was playing a Fender Mustang. And I asked him about it afterwards. And at that point, they were not available new. You could only buy a used one. They were pretty expensive. Um, so I would check magazines, you know, music magazines would come in. I check and no Mustangs, no Mustangs. And then one day um, I opened a magazine, there was a Fender Mustang and I ordered it, ordered it um, probably within minutes, went for the red. Um, it's, it's so easy to play. So it's a short scale. I was going to ask you, I, uh, tell, yeah. but I thought it might. Um, I mean, I, I'm sure that there are camps who believe in, you know, the, the longer scale, but if you're fighting to reach the notes, um, it's, it's just not a good situation. You want to be able to play comfortably yeah. and not be fighting your bass. Um, what a concept. Yeah. Yeah. So the Dan Electro is short scale. Um, this is short scale. And I think they sound just as good as long scale. Again, I'm sure there are people who would who might hear the difference, but by the time you're going through a rig, you're changing the sound anyway. And the most important thing is to uh, not have those dropout zones and um, to have, to have warmth and be able to, to play it and just, you know, move your hands around and have it be like butter. I want to talk about, uh, I want to ask you about playing bass and learning bass. For bass players only is basically an instruction site. And we have people mm -hmm. from almost every state in the U.S. and 50, 60 countries around the world coming to For Bass Players Only every day to learn bass. Mm -hmm. And most of them are in their 50s, 60s, 70s, sometimes even older. So they're not looking to be rock stars. They're not looking to, you know, take over the world. They just... They've always wanted to do it, most of them. Some of them have dabbled or they're beginners, but they just want to get together with their friends and play some classic rock riffs or some blues shuffles or some you know, walking bass or whatever it is. And <laughs> a lot of times when you get to be that age, things like arthritis and tendonitis and other things creep into our bodies. So I, I just tell you all this to give you a, a context of who we're talking to and who we're talking about. So with that information, what advice can you impart to somebody like that who wants to learn to play bass? What do you think they should know? Uh, I would say it's not too late to take lessons. Uh, you can definitely get a method book and learn from that. I, I would say um, at least learn somewhat from a method book. Um, when I play with the feelies, I'm not, I'm not thinking about what note I'm playing. I just, I just hear it. I go to it. I hear the melody and I play. So certainly playing by ear 
is is a wonderful thing to do, but it's really good to know um, the names of the notes and where they are. Um, as you age, if you start to lose that muscle memory, um, here I am, I'm talking and I'm, I'm playing at the same time, um, you can latch on to the name of the note and where it is. Um, I, I wanna share that during the lockdown when the feelies didn't play, and I couldn't, you know, that time was so kind of dark and deep. I couldn't even imagine playing again. I wondered, are we, are we ever going to play again? Are live concerts ever going to come back? So I didn't play Feely's music for a really long time. And, um, and husband Rich and I would just play guitars and, you know, do, a, do acoustic music just for our own pleasure. Um, so then when I went back to the bass, um, I totally restructured how I was playing. I used to play, because this is just where, where I went to, this was my comfort spot, I would play up the neck. So instead of playing an open A or a D or a G, I would find it up on the E string or the A string and just play, find the patterns there, the boxes or the triangles or whatever. But I could get lost in a song because I didn't actually know what note I was playing. You know, so if someone said, okay, let's go to a G, I would have to think for a moment, oh, where is that G? You know, obviously the open G, but where is it up on the neck? So I, I kind of laid my muscle memory aside, relearned the songs using all four strings lower on the neck now there are some there are some songs that do work better higher on the neck if you're doing those pentatonic scales much easier to do that um but as far as like wearing out your fingers like why why are you wearing out your fingers playing up here when you can just be playing an open string give your finger a break for a second um yeah, so my advice is maybe, uh, again, is um, know the notes, know where you can find, all, you know, those different notes lower on the neck and also higher on the neck. So you can play um, lower or higher, depending on what is more comfortable for you. Um, so the method book will will teach you the notes. Um but certainly, you know, play by ear, you know, go by feel. Um, also in a method book, it will tell you um, proper playing technique. Uh, proper playing technique will help you to avoid injury or wearing out your fingers. Um, carpal tunnel. I've gone through carpal tunnel syndrome. I've gone through trigger finger. Um, and, and, um, having trigger finger was the main reason why I stopped playing with a pick because no, sorry, sorry. I, I injured myself and I had tenosynovitis for a while, which is basically tendonitis in the wrist. Say it again. I didn't get the yeah, name. Tenosynovitis. Teno with a T? T. Yeah. Tenoseno. Tenosynovitis. Tenosynovitis. Right, a fancy word for tendonitis, and that's tendonitis in the wrist. So I couldn't hold a pick, and I wore a brace for a while, you know, a, a, a loose brace, and I had to start using my fingers again. And so I just stayed with that, although very, like, the Feelies just did a couple shows in Massachusetts this past weekend, and I was back to using a pick sometimes. It, it was just feeling more comfortable to go back and forth. Wow. Uh, and, and also finger exercises, um, strengthen your fingers. Uh, I, I went for physical therapy for that, uh, for trigger, trigger finger and got some really good exercises that have really helped a lot. So I'm able to play with, with no pain, no restrictions, oh, uh, but I know it's a fine line. You can cross that line into injury and, and then you, you're not sure if you're going to make it back into good health. And, and sometimes it's just a physical therapy session away. 
Good advice. What about the future? You, you mentioned a couple of things, the other album coming out, and uh, the Feelies are back together now, right? Yes, we've been playing since 2008. Uh, we don't do long tours. It's generally two or three dates at a time. So um, at times it's been once a month. At times it's been um, uh, maybe eight shows a year. You know, certainly COVID just kind of threw a wrench in everything. Um, but uh, like from from March through November, we can play as many two as much as um, two shows a month. So they're they're like mini tours. Anything else you'd like to do that you haven't already done? You've accomplished quite a bit in your career. <laughs> um, get back into slap bass. So I was looking at your your site about uh, the slap bass technique, which is what I learned under my teacher um, when I was taking bass lessons and I haven't done it in years. So I've kind of lost the muscle memory on that, but I, I think that would be a goal to be able to do that. I mean, not that I could use it in the feelies, but just to, just to do it for fun. Moderation is the key. Yeah. <laughs> that was my first book that came out in 1992 and it, it had, it came with a cassette in the cover oh and then later it was fancy it came with a cd in the yeah cover. right <laughs> and now it's all online and actually we redid that we did a 20-year anniversary edition of that and uh that was <laughs> that was already a long time ago mm -hmm. but I, I went to every single person that endorsed it and i i said would you mind reiterating your endorsement saying something like 20 years later it's still a great book or i still stand by what i said Every single one came through. John Patitucci, who wrote the forward, Stu Ham, uh, Mark Egan, Bob Cranshaw, who's no longer with us, and uh, I, I can't remember who else. Was it Victor Wooten? No, that was a different one. Anyway, yeah, well, that's a that's a good skill. I remember how excited I was about that whole thing. I went crazy over that back in the '80s, learning how mm -hmm. to slap. So mm -hmm. great! I encourage you, and if you want to talk about it, hit me up, and we'll uh, we'll talk slap. <laughs> Okay. And, and just a question. Um, do you have, have, okay. Have you ever interviewed Carol Kay? Yes, I have. Wonderful. Yeah. Um, I'd, I'd like Gordon. to do it again. Cause that was quite a long time ago. Mm -hmm. And what did you ask me? Uh, Kim Gordon. No, she's on the list, but I uh, haven't, uh, haven't, haven't gotten that one yet. Okay. Tina Weymouth. You know what I'm getting at? I am. Women yeah. bass players. She's uh, she's oh well women bass players just this year alone uh, Yolanda Charles and uh, Divinity Rocks I've got uh, by the time this interview airs uh, you were you were talking about Talking Heads uh, Julie Slick will be on there and uh, who else Ariana Cap wonderful bass player Rhonda Smith who played with Jeff Beck for a long time um, I don't know a, a lot of female bass players there are some great. Oh, uh, uh, Tanya O'Callaghan was playing with Whitesnake now, interviewed her oh. a few times. So rock and roll people, jazz people, funky mm. people. Uh, yeah, there's a lot of wonderful female bass players. And I'm, I'm sure I'll think of a lot more as soon as we're done. Yeah, talking. yeah. No, you, you've mentioned plenty. So good, good to hear. <laughs> I'd like to get Michelle and Dege Ocello. I'd like to get uh, Esperanza Spalding. You know, there's uh, I've got I've got a list. Mm -hmm. Of, uh, we, we just published our 800th interview in March of 2023, 800th weekly consecutive interview. Wow. So uh, there's, there's, there's still more to go. There's still mm -hmm. other people we can interview. I do have one last question for you, Brenda. If you can imagine, what would you be if you weren't a bass player? Something outside of music. Uh, oh, wow. Um... I don't know. I, I, I um, went to art school, which was how I met the Feelies, um, a, a, a friend. I met uh, a woman who became a friend and she knew, like she was friends with um, some of the Feelies um, people, the, the Heldon people. Um, so I guess it would be art because I did go to art school and I did have a day job in publishing um, I restored photographs. So, although that's a, that's a 
that's a dying art because, you know, <laughs> everything's on the cloud now. Um, Maybe they'll so come back I, just like vinyl came back and, and the music side. What was that? I said, maybe it'll come back just like vinyl came back on the yes. music sign. So if there are like hardcore photograph people, maybe they have an appreciation for restored photos. It's still kind of a niche thing. <laughs> it, it is. Yeah. 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 So I guess it would have been art. Something creative. Or so something in the, yeah, in the publishing photography um, field. Wonderful. Well, congratulations on all your success. And I'm so happy to see you're still doing it. Okay, well, thank you. Yeah. Incarnation is the album Tricycle. Is, is there an, an official release date? It was on Record Store it Day. It was on Record Store Day, yeah. And I have to say that um, only 500 um, copies were pressed and 475 sold. Wonderful. So um, apologies more. to anyone who's trying to buy it and they can't. Yes. So we are pressing more. And as soon as, so don't, don't buy from the the um hackers the bootleggers uh, don't, yeah the boot right um hold out and you can just buy it at the actual cost so record store day had to happen you know give a little breathing room and um digital download only will be available for purchase through Bandcamp, the uh, delmore recording society um band camp I'm glad you mentioned that. But there will be more vinyl pressed. It will be uh, probably it will be green this time. Very cool. All right. Wonderful. Brenda Sauter, congratulations. Wonderful having you on for Bass Players Only. And like I mentioned earlier, we should do a follow up because I know there's lots more cool things in store that you're going to do that our audience would be interested in hearing. So okay. thanks again for joining us. I'm John Liebman, founder and first baseman of ForBassPlayersOnly.com. A lot of people think they're too old or it's too late for them to learn how to play an instrument. So I created for bass players only for people mostly over 50 who want to learn bass because I believe you're never too old and it's never too late to experience the joy and the pleasure of making music. For bass players only, that's what we're all about. I will see you all next week, same time, same place right here at for bass players only. In the meantime, let's play bass.